can deny that computers and electronics have revolutionized life on this planet. And many serious researchers are claiming that some of this gallery can be useful in a quite unexpected way to contact the dead, or at least to allow the dead to contact us. Of course we are scared of them, and even if we don't believe in them, subconsciously we cannot ignore them. But is our encounter with ghosts or the dead only till the horror flicks or stories about them? No. Since ages we have been fascinated about the hereafter what happens to us after we die and in communicating with those who already crossed over, just to know a little bit more about their world. Seances, Ouija boards, tarot cards, attempts to communicate with the dead have been documented back to the early human history and became quite popular in the 19th century. But if any of the methods for communicating with the dead work, why don't we receive more convincing information about the other side? Perhaps we are not allowed to get better information and for whatever reason, perhaps the possibility of a life after death is supposed to remain a mystery. I am your host, Maria Anna van Driel and you are listening to the next truth where science and myth meet. And this week I'm speaking with internationally known and professional psychic medium Tracy Farquhar about what it means to be a psychic medium in the 21st century. Welcome to the show of the next truth where science and myth meet. As I just shared in your intro, you are a professional psychic medium. But for those people who are less familiar with the term, what is a psychic medium? Well, thanks for having me. Um, sure, the, the term psychic medium refers to someone who is able to tune into energy. So as a psychic, I'm able to tune into the energy of a person with the intention of helping to give them some guidance on their life's path. And as a medium, I'm able to tune into the energy of spirit, uh, which is a non-physical realm, with the intention of bringing some messages or information to their loved ones who are still here. When was the first time, the first moment that you understood that you knew that you have these abilities, these psychic skills? Well, it wasn't really that long ago, although my whole life I've been a very sensitive person. So as a child, I was labeled sensitive and shy and quiet. Mm -hmm. I didn't like a lot of people around me, a lot of loud noises. But I can't say that I really had experiences that I would label as psychic or mediumship experiences growing up. But I always felt that there was something wrong with me because I was so sensitive. But it wasn't until I started taking a workshop in psychic development that I started to recognize that that sensitivity also translated into the ability to connect with energy. And that because I was able to do that, it was that energy that was really making me feel overwhelmed 
And so I've learned to manage that and, and use it to my advantage. So I started taking those classes about 10 years ago, 16 years ago, something like that, and very quickly started to develop a passion for this work. And um, within a few years, I was doing it as a profession. So it's been about eight years now that I've been doing it full time as my career. So you say that you got overwhelmed by the energies of, of people, animals and everything around you and that you have learned how to, well, to deal with all these kind of vibrations and energies. But how does one well, learn this? Well, I believe we all have a certain degree of those sensitivities that we come into this life with. Uh, of course, there's going to be some people who are more sensitive than others, but I think anyone can learn to connect with that natural ability just with practice and with really believing in it. Most of us don't believe it because we're not taught to believe it. We're taught that it's not real. We're taught that mm -hmm. um, our intuition is not to be trusted. We're taught that psychic and mediumship abilities aren't real. And in fact, in some cases, we're taught that they're evil or bad. So our culture in general is not very welcoming to it. And even mm -hmm. if you grow up with very open-minded parents or family, we're still very heavily influenced by our culture. And so there's a lot of ridicule around those abilities. And so it affects our belief system. And if we have a belief that those things aren't real, even if we have experiences, we will just write them off as being in our, from our imagination and, and not a real experience. So we need to work on that belief system first, because if you're not believing it, you're not going to have the experience. You know, you're not going to have it as, as a true experience you're going to write it off as something mm -hmm. else. And so, it, you know, it, it takes some, some support. And I, that's why I think a, a, a class or a group situation is helpful uh, so that you have a support system with people who you can talk about these things with. And that's why I teach classes, because I find that people often really benefit from having that kind of support system. Whereas in their family situation or even among their friends, they may get some ridicule when they talk about these experiences. Um, it's not like I teach people how to be psychic. I teach them to believe in themselves and break down the barriers that they have to those natural abilities. Now you say that there is a lot of ridicule about people, uh, of towards people um, who have these uh, special skills, if I might call it like that. What, what is the most common uh, thing that people uh, mention that they are being ridiculed about? I mean, what do the, if I may call it so as well, uh, the out, outside world is, is telling them, uh, except for the fact that it is probably fantasy or that it's not true or you are making a, a theater out of things or something like that. Mm -hmm. What is the most way people ridicule people who are sensitive for the energies around them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think all of what you just said is true. You know, that the, they believe that people are making it up, that they're fooling people uh, for the purpose of, of getting money out of them. And unfortunately, there are psychics who do that. And, yeah. and unfortunately, that, that gives the whole profession a bad name. You know, there are psychics who will tell someone they have a curse on them that's very common. And, and then, ask for a large amount of money to have the curse removed. And it's, it's very sad that that happens, but that doesn't mean that all psychics are frauds. You know, every profession has its fraudulent fact and, you know, factor in it, but psychics seem, seem to have a lot of that. And, you know, I mean, I myself have been ridiculed and, you know, I have some books that have been published and some of the reviews on the books were, were pretty harsh, you know? So, it's something that I've had to just deal with and, um, you know, just understand that what I do is not for everyone and I don't expect it to be. So if, if it's not for someone, that's they're not who I'm directing it to, you know, so I don't have to worry about what they think. What kind of clients um, do you have uh, in your profession? 
as a psychic medium? Well, I think people who are pretty open-minded, who have a belief that this is a, a real thing, that people do have the ability to connect with energy, people who are looking for a different perspective on their lives, looking for some direction or guidance from, you know, from a higher viewpoint. So, so the sense that the intention that, that I have in helping to guide people, it's because I can see their lives from a different perspective than they can. So it's similar to a therapist, but certainly not therapy. You know, I'm not a licensed therapist in any way, but, uh, you know, mm -hmm. as a therapist is able to uh, give the client a different perspective from their training. You know, for me, it's that I'm able to tune into their energy and sense some of the things that might actually be going on beneath their experiences that they can't see because they're they're experiencing it right in front of them, you know. Um, so the, the clients are people who are just, you know, looking for some wisdom and guidance and are open to how that's going to come through. And then with the mediumship, there are people who, you know, want to hear from loved ones who have passed uh, just to be reassured that they're okay and that they're happy. And then I also provide a spirit guide reading for people who are interested to find out about the guides that they have and what those guides are supporting for them in their life. Well, I have heard about that, uh, about the, uh, people having guides mm -hmm. a, a few times, but uh, how how do how do I have to see these uh, guides? As as do I have to see them as angels or angel-like figures, or is that for everybody the same or, or different? Is that a, perhaps somebody you knew from um, from from the past, from when you were young, a grandmother or uh, an uncle or some someone like that? Or is it more like a mystical figure or creature? Mm -hmm. So what are these guides? How do they look like? And how can guides like, well, non-physical uh, figures guide the living? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, from my experience and, you know, from what I've read and what I've, you know, what, what resonates with me, uh, I feel like we have guides who are part of our soul family. So I believe that when we are in spirit form, before we come here in the physical, we have a soul family, just like we have families here in the physical, but it's a more, uh, it's more of a spiritual connection with other spiritual beings. And mm, yeah. we decide to come here and, and have an incarnated life experience, some of our soul family will take on the role of a guide with the intention of just helping us through this life experience because it is a challenge. I believe we have more than one guide and that they will have different energy that they can lend to us depending on what's going on in our life at that time. They are guides that are with us from birth. So they won't be somebody that we know from this lifetime Although we can have loved ones who cross over, who sometimes step in and also help us out. Now, when I talk about us getting guidance, it isn't normally received consciously. You know, it's not like we are receiving this, these words in our head, but it can be something. Yeah, that, that was, that was the, the, the next question that I was wanted to ask is why certain people do not listen to their guides. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think, Again, it's not like we are getting this, these, these words of guidance in our minds, in our waking minds, but we can be getting the guidance through our intuition. So it's another reason to learn to really listen to our intuition. It is that, that urge to do something or that, that little signal that you get that something needs your attention or just that, that mm -hmm. feeling that you have to kind of look over here. It's, it's very subtle. But often we ignore it because we don't believe our intuition is real. The guidance still comes through, but it's not normally received consciously. So in having a spirit guide reading with me, it's just bringing that experience up into the conscious mind a little bit more so that people can be a little more aware that 
you know, the, these guides are here to help you. They're not going to tell you what to do, but they want to help you through some of the more challenging times in your life. Um, and if we listen to our intuition, you know, people say, listen to your heart. To me, it's the same thing. You know, just really going to that feeling place, you know, asking what am I sensing or feeling about the situation and, and learning to do that as well as going up into the thinking intellectual mind. Normally, that's where we default to. You know, what do I think about this? What's the logical choice? There's nothing wrong with that. But we also want to kind of tap into the feeling part of us, which can be where that guidance is coming through. And and this this reading is, is what you call channeling. Channeling to me is something different. So um, I'm a psychic medium and a channel. So as a psychic and a medium, I receive information that I have to then put into words and explain to the person that I'm doing the reading for. You know, I will sometimes see images or pictures, which is clairvoyance, which means clear seeing, or I'll get feelings, or sometimes hear an inner voice, uh, which is clear audience. Um, but I have to then put that into words and, you know, use, use my intellect to translate that for the person. Channeling is a more direct mm -hmm. form of communication where a non-physical being communicates through the channel. So the channel is not receiving and translating. The channel is simply transmitting the, the, the information that's coming directly from the spirit. So what you are saying, and correct me if I'm incorrect, is that you are directly listening to the voices of, if I may call it so, the hereafter, or the, 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 the realms that we do not yet understand, um, use your voice so that we uh, can hear what our guides are telling us. Yeah, so when it comes to a, a connection with the spirit guide, I will at first get a sense of the energy of that guide. For instance, it could be uh, a very masculine energy, which has nothing to do with gender. It just can be more of an assertive energy, an energy that wants the person to speak their mind or wants them to be more grounded in themselves. So, you know, I usually feel if it's a more masculine or feminine energy. And so it might be a time in that person's life where they need to be more assertive or sure of themselves. So I'll get a sense of what that energy is. And then I'll get a sense of what it is that that guide is encouraging that person to do or or work on in, in their life at that moment. And and again, the, the, that information comes through in various ways, again, through images, pictures in my mind, words that I get, or just a feeling or emotion that I then convey to the person. And, and this is what you describe in your book, because you also have written... Uh, I believe three books. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And, and, and this channeling you explain in your books um, are, uh, except for uh, the explaining about channeling and, and being a psychic medium and how a psychic medium is standing in the 21st century, are there also personal stories from you uh, in, in your books? Uh, not in my books, no. In the, the my two books that are channeled, uh, these are books that are completely channeled from a group of beings who identify themselves as Frank. And so this group of beings oh. channels through me. And so the book, the first book was called Frank Talk, because that's what they identify with that name. The second book is called okay, channeled, yeah. channeled Messages from Deep Space. But okay. this group shares some wisdom and advice for the human race and addresses some of the situations in our world right now. And th these books were written several years ago, but a lot of what they had said in both of those books, is very relevant to what's going on right now in the world. So those, those are completely channeled. The second book, The Channeled Messages from Deep Space was written, co-written with Mike Dooley, who is a, a new thought teacher and Hay House author. And so it, that book is more like an interview. It's a question and answer 
format for that book. A question answer with the hereafter. Am I correct in that? Or because I, I have no idea which kind of terms are being used in uh, with people who have the profession as a psychic medium. Mm -hmm. So I am a little bit guessing here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the this group named that call themselves Frank are actually not human spirits. They are from another realm. And so okay. they're not the same as what you would consider to be spirits in the hereafter. Does somebody has to be born with the full skills? I mean, that somebody um, is at the age of, well, let's say seven, and say, oh my God, I, I, I know what you are thinking. I can see clearly in my mind the images of your, your thoughts or somebody else's thoughts. Or is it a process? that takes years of experiences and, 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 and learning from other people, etc. Mm -hmm. So is it something that is going like, bang, and it's there, or is it a process? You know, it's, it's not about reading thoughts. That's mind reading, and that's totally different. I don't read people's thoughts. But I do believe that oh, okay. many, many children do have experiences that seem to be sort of paranormal metaphysical experiences many children report seeing spirits or just being aware of them mm -hmm. i had an experience with my own child who who remembered a past life and would talk about it oh. as though it was just a natural thing to talk about yes. and i think you know children don't understand that these things are unusual and that people don't talk about them until one day they do understand that you know uh, mm -hmm. and they will start to recognize that people are looking a little concerned when they talk about these things or or telling them it's just their imagination and so they will start to block it and they will stop talking mm -hmm. about it you know again i really believe we all have these abilities it's just a matter of you know first of all the the degree of ability the degree of sensitivity we all have different degrees of everything and the interest and the you know the ability to really want to delve into that area of expertise and develop it just like anything else you could be born with a musical ability but never want to take the time to develop that right so i don't think it's that unusual but i think it is more unusual for people to want to pursue it because of as we've talked about you know the ridicule and the the mistrust that people have for them, uh, it's isolating. And it, it, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of work. It's it's not a profession for the faint-hearted. <laughs> um, what do you mean with that it's not a profession for uh, faint-hearted? Do I have to think about um, that somebody is getting images or thoughts or uh, are sensing feelings that are beyond well, Nightmare on Elm Street, for instance, or um, how do I have to see that? Um, I've never had a negative experience myself. I've never felt no, okay. threatened or frightened. Um, I have a very strong intention to only connect with that which is in the highest good of my clients. So, you know, I have no interest in delving into anything that is, you know, negative or dark. Um, there's again a, so much of what we see in the media about spirit communication is is frightening you know they focus on the kind of dark aspect and there are people who really believe that it's all evil and it's all demonic and so there's a lot of fear around that i personally have never had that experience i don't delve into that area but what i mean by it's not a it's not for the faint hearted is that again it it takes a lot of energy and you know you you are constantly dealing with people's problems listening to people's yeah. you know sometimes very severe problems in their lives mm -hmm. and as a sensitive person as much as i can detach myself from that and protect myself from that it's still i feel it you know and um and so yeah. it takes a lot of energy it takes a lot uh, of focus and attention and you know to to really hold that connection 
I'm very grateful to be able to do it. And I think it's a real blessing for me to be able to do this work that is that I'm so passionate about. And, you know, it is it's not it's not easy. It was much easier when I was an administrative assistant, but I didn't get as much you know, joy and pleasure out of that as I do out of this. Uh, something completely different. You mentioned briefly uh, to me in a Facebook message that you do not use crystal balls and never have done. But you are using tarot cards, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. How do tarot cards work? I mean, how do you read them? There are so many different pictures in there and, and sometimes they are upside down and, and sometimes they are cross and, and or right or whatever. And, and I, I have a deck of cards also myself and I have no clue how to use these things. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, I, I resisted using tarot cards for a long time because I thought just what you're saying, they're too complicated, there's too much to learn. I didn't want to have to memorize 78 cards. So I had a lot of beliefs mm -hmm. about them that made me avoid them. But then I started to just experiment with them. And I found that it was a very useful tool because they're full of symbols. And I love symbols. You know, we, we have symbols around us all the time that represent things. You know, I see everything in life pretty much as a metaphor or a symbol that's you know helping me to learn about myself so the cards really resonated with me when i started to get past the idea that it was something that i had to memorize so there are symbols that are archetypes and those symbols are things that represent something that we will all pretty much you know so for instance if there's a lion most of us would say it represents strength and um, power, uh, you know, there's there are things that just seem to have a, a, a universal meaning. But when I read the cards, you know, I know enough, just a little bit about the tarot. I'm not an expert in tarot, but I understand, you know, I did do a little study and I understand the different suits and symbols. But what I think is more important is that I read them from my intuition. So what is that card saying to me? Of, and how does that relate to the person that I'm doing the reading for? To me, the cards tell a story. So I pull cards that represent past, present, and future, and then one card that summarizes everything. So it kind of pulls me into the client's story, and it helps me to show them what, have, what they've learned, what they can have learned from their past, you know, where they are in their present moment and what the possibilities are for their future and so it's a it's a it's a picture that i can then kind of see in front of me which helps me to connect with the client and and give them what they need to help them through whatever it is that they're going through so i, I think when we use tools there are, you know, there are people who like different types of tools which help you to have a point of focus and they help to clarify and kind of uh, give a story to what it is that you're picking up. Tower cards is just one of those tools. And, and another tool is for instance, a Ouija board, but I have heard that you shouldn't use that. It's the, the channel is, the, the door is too wide. There can be too much coming in, etc. Have you ever used a, a Ouija board in your life? Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was one of the things that my sisters used to use when I was growing up. So as I said, I had a pretty open-minded family and my my sister mm -hmm. is a psychic. And so, you know, she used to use the Ouija board and it was fascinating. So, you know, I didn't grow up having a fear of them. Uh, I don't use one regularly now, but I have used them. And just like anything else, <clears throat> I think it all has to do with your intention. Your intention is very powerful. So, you know, you want to yeah. ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is it that I want to get out of this experience? And so again, as, as a psychic, my intention is to help guide my clients. As a medium, my intention is to bring messages from the spirit realm which are comforting and uplifting for the people that they've left behind. So a lot of times the Ouija board is seen as something scary 
or evil or dark. And people will use it with that intention to have a frightening experience or to call in something that they really should not be messing with, you know. The Ouija board the Ouija boards have been sold as as a toy in toy stores. Yeah. You know? Yes. So young yes. people will yes. use them with no real sense of what they're doing. And then they have no. a frightening experience and then all of a sudden everyone says the Ouija boards are, you know, harmful scary uh it's not the board yeah. it's the intention and and again it, it, if if you yeah. have a, a negative experience with the board you stop using it you know I, I i again have not so i can't speak to that so much but i know that intention is very very important so if you if you are uncomfortable with the ouija board or if you you have a bad feeling about them don't use them you know, it's as simple as that do you think that if we have been taught that tarot cards, for instance, are, well, demonic, satanic, or is, is recalling or calling um, negative um, experiences instead of the Ouija board, that it was vice versa, that it was converted, that the Ouija board was a positive thing? Do you think that we would not have used the tarot cards, but more in a positive way, the, the Ouija board, that it is a little bit of mind uh, playing, a, a game of the mind that we are automatically, without our awareness, putting the negativity into that board and thus is rising a negative um, experience or things falling off the closet or windows breaking open or at, something in that direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Well, our beliefs are, and again, our intentions and our beliefs are very, very powerful. And so if you, you know, you're, you are constantly creating your reality with what you believe because your beliefs create a filter through which you experience the world. So for instance, if you are walking down a dark street uh, in a town you don't know, and you are on guard and you're afraid, you're feeling fear. Mm -hmm. If a cat runs in front of you, you're probably going to jump and scream and immediately go into that place that something bad is happening. So if you have yes. a fear of spirit communication of, or just of the spirit realm in general, and you have an experience of sensing that, even though it may be something like your grandmother, connecting with you, if you're in fear of it, it's going to be interpreted as a negative experience. So it's really important before you do any of this work to check in with yourself. And if you have fears around this, it's important to deal with that first, because that fear is going to interpret an experience for you in a way that may not be the truth. Now, Tracy, from a scientific point of view, how, if possible at all, can all the skills and abilities of a psychic medium as yourself be explained by science? I mean, do I have to think of the simple explanation of people, some people just being fine tuned to body language for uh, when somebody is blinking with his eyes or so, uh, uh, somebody is uh, waving with her uh, hands, for instance, or the facial expressions, that somebody is so fine-tuned in that form of language that they seem to predict almost what people are going to think. And do you think that science can explain the skills of a psychic medium as so? Well, I think that's something different. Um, I think, yes, there are people who are uh, very fine-tuned in that way. I believe that would be more like an empath or someone who has highly empathic skills where they're really able to read uh, a combination of body language, facial expression, and the cadence of the speech and what people are saying. For me, I have my eyes closed when I do readings for people throughout the whole thing so, so that I'm not connecting with that. I don't want to be influenced by that, okay. their facial expressions, their body language. Mm -hmm. You know, the scientific community does not accept psychics and mediums. They, you know, there, there, there is a sense that 
they are some in the scientific community are are open to the idea that there could be something going on there but there's never been any scientific mm -hmm. proof of it but for me what i the way that i understand it is and, and the way i explain it is that we're we're all energy in in an, at, on an atomic level we are nothing but tiny swirling blobs of energy with lots of space in between yeah. and and so that mm -hmm. energy is is it a constant vibration and the things we see with our five senses are vibrating at a certain frequency so that our senses are able yes. to pick them up but we also know that there are lots of other forms of energy that exist that we are not able to perceive with our five senses that's scientific fact mm -hmm. so there there is energy that we project outside of our physical beings there is the energy of you know the, non-physical beings uh, again not accepted by the scientific community but that's what i believe and what i have experienced and so if i'm an energetic being i can connect with other energetic beings and whether that's a living yes. being or a non-living being and to me again it's not such an unusual thing to do we all have those moments of sensing energy even if we don't believe any of this People will walk into a room mm -hmm. and say, boy, the, the, the energy is heavy in here. We'll say things like, mm -hmm. you could cut the air with a knife. You know, it's just that we yeah. use that language that means we are tuning into energy all the time, whether we believe mm -hmm. that that's what we're doing or not. So it's a mm -hmm. natural ability, again, but we get talked out of it. And it and because we we are talked into the the feeling that if I can't see it with my eyes, it doesn't exist. But we know that's not true. There is not, you know, there are radio waves and Wi-Fi waves and electricity and everything in the air all the time that we can't see. Correct. It, it exists. So to me, it's not that much different from that. Why do you think that one person has these skills much stronger uh, or possess is possessing these skills much stronger than another person because as you say so we are born with the skills all are born with these skills and we possess them but with you for instance you are much more skilled than i am and that is a bit strange because we are being born in the same world uh, that's not all i am i'm also a writer you know i also have a little bit of musical ability there there are other parts of me that i feel that i'm good at uh, I don't think it's any different from any of those things. You know, again, there are people who are born with extraordinary musical talents. People who are born knowing that they want to go yes. into the musical field and are really good at that. The people born with really strong mathematical skills. And I think it's just a matter of what our spirit decided we wanted to experience in this life. My, my uh, sincere apologies for the sounds in the background, but that is my dog. He is walking over a, <laughs> a slippery floor, over a smooth floor here with his nails. So um, <laughs> I have my dog always with me. It's, it's my shadow <laughs> for the past 11 years. So um, Tracy, um, as we are also talking to young people, can you quickly run over again um, what a psychic medium is, how you can, well, uh, upgrade your skills where you were born with, if I may call it like that, um, and what kind of advice do you have for people, for young people who are sensitive, born being sensitive in this world and are starting to get overwhelmed and being labeled as ADHD or mm -hmm. as depressed or, or whatever. What kind of advice do you have for these people? What does psychic medium mean? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, again, for in, in my experience, I was just highly sensitive my whole life. And so, you know, these days we call that a highly sensitive person. And then I'm also an introvert, mm -hmm. which means, you know, I'm, I, my energy needs time to re recharge and i need to be alone a lot of times um that i can be easily overwhelmed and so you know again because of 
the culture uh, that I was raised in, I, I believed that that meant there was something wrong with me for most of my life, uh, up until the last 15 or 16 years. So I think recognizing that your sensitivities do not indicate that there's something wrong with you. And in fact, those sensitivities are something that the world really needs. We need more compassionate, loving, sensitive people. And so I think really understanding those things as a gift and learning to manage them. So if you are overwhelmed by crowds, you want to limit your exposure to crowds. If you're overwhelmed by sound, you want to you know, honor that and realize when you need to withdraw, when you need to go within yourself and not see that as something that's wrong, uh, no matter what anyone else tells you. You know, take yeah. care of yourself and your own energy and use those sensitivities in a way that help you listen to your intuition. You know, take care of yourself, amp up your self care, listen to your own needs and make sure that you have a very strong support system around you, that the people that you associate with are kind and loving and supportive and that you spend less time with the people who are not. Because if you have that support system, you will recognize that they love you just as you are. And, and that will help you to see that there's nothing wrong with you. And then if you want to use those abilities in another way, find a class. Find, you know, there are lots of classes and online programs that could help you get in touch with that part of yourself, learn to manage it and use it as the gift that it is. What lies beyond our understanding of life? What it is that is dwelling in these foggy realms, which is better known as the hereafter. Do we preserve our awareness when we have crossed over? And are we still able of contacting beloved ones when our physical body stops existing? These are indeed fascinating, but hard to answer questions. It seems we are just at the beginning of a remarkable revolution. Tracy, I like to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you and gaining more clear and deeper insight into what a, a psychic medium is and of course what you are doing. But I see that the hour is almost over. Uh, but before we close out, can you tell us where we can find more information on your books, on your online classes and workshops and for people uh, to contact you when they have questions for you? Yes, thank you. It's uh, my website is simply tracyfarquhar.com, uh, and that's where you can find all of that information about the further classes and workshops I offer. I offer everything by phone and on on uh, online on Zoom. Uh, so I, you know, I, I connect with people all over the world. Uh, so you can find all the details there, and you can even find a link to book an appointment or register for a class on my website. Thank you all for tuning in this week on The Next Truth, where science and myth meet. Make sure to visit our website, www.nexttruth.com. That is nexttruth, all in one word, dot com. And let us know what you think about our podcast. While you're at it, if you find value in this show, we would appreciate a rating on our website in the section The Next Truth Podcasts. Or if you would simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us too. I am Maria Anna van Driel with The Next Truth. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.